your patience while we get set up at this last minute. Uh, I am very pleased that so many of you have turned out for this talk on the dark side of health informatics, some insights from the humanities and social sciences. Please come in. We had this ta talk originally given to the Health Inf Informatics Boot Camp in June of this year, and it was such a great talk that we just had to ask Catherine to come back and give it again so that people at the University of Waterloo and others could hear it and also to get it included on our Health Informatics Alive uh, presentation archive. So I'm very pleased that we could arrange it for this month. But before we let Kathy start, I'd like to let you know that next Wednesday we will be holding our last of the anniversary series, 50th anniversary series, the Why Not uh, Smarter Health Seminar Series. And we will be uh, having a talk on why not advance health informatics education through our colleges. This talk will be given by Stefan Pantazzi and Yuri Kogolowski. They are both professors at the School of Health Sciences and Community Services and Biotechnology at the Conestoga College Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning. That's quite a mouthful. Anyway, they will be given, giving this talk at 3 o'clock in the adjacent uh, lecture hall in DC 1302. Prior to that, we will be holding a mini workshop on health informatics education. We'll be looking at the curriculum and programs uh, that have been developed in Canada, as well as examining the, uh, the uh, initiatives that have been proposed for this campus. So I invite you all to come to that uh, talk and that, as well as the mini workshop. The mini workshop will start at 1.30 in the same room and then we'll proceed directly to the seminar. It's very important that we discuss the, the education of health informatics. Uh, we're severely short of people, professionals, trained in health informatics, and we somehow have to handle what Dominic calls the silent crisis. So please join us for that mini workshop as well as the seminar. So without any further ado, Mahar, will you introduce our speaker? And good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Catherine Schreier, from the Department of a Professor of the Department of English, Language and Literature, and the Director of the Center for Teaching Excellence University of Waterloo. She recently received the National Council of Teachers of English Award for Best Article Reporting Qualitative or Quantitative Research in Technical or Scientific Communication. Uh, Professor Schreier uh, specializes in professional writing, composition, and rhetoric and general theory, and the development of online courses. She is presently engaged in several collaborative uh, funded project, uh, projects, uh, constructing case studies that investigate this course in medical settings and online learning in professional context. Uh, today, Professor Schreier will talk about the dark side of health informatics some insights from the humanities and social sciences. Please welcome Dr. Schreier. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to come to uh, talk to you today. And as Shirley mentioned, this, you have to imagine yourself as a slightly different audience. Uh, I designed this talk actually for people who are really involved in hospital settings in, in terms of implementing uh, technologies in hospital settings. And uh, I wanted to kind of capture some of my slight misgivings that I have about some of the research that I've actually seen on EMRs and EPRs. So that's my reference to the dark side of health informatics. And of course, there's also a light side as well uh, to uh, health informatics. So in my talk today, I've got three purposes. I'd like to share some of my misgivings with you. I would like to share some research findings uh, that come from my side of the field. And when I say my side of the field, I should say fields, because I'm, I'm a very interdisciplinary researcher. So I've kind of combined uh, humanities research and, and social science research, and a lot, of course, uh, research into medical communication. At the same time, I'm, um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about some theoretical perspectives that actually come from the humanities and the social sciences. One of the things I've noticed uh, in, in terms of some of the talks that I've been to 
is, is uh, a, a, like a lack of theorizing around uh, some of the changes that are happening in terms of, of bringing technologies in, into the workplace. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about that as well. As I always tell my graduate students, you know, don't be afraid of theory. Theories are only glasses that you put on in order to see certain kinds of things. They allow you to see certain kinds of things and also not to see uh, certain kinds of things. OK, you're going to work? No. Maybe if I try. Ah, OK. Uh, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about who the heck I am. Uh, the people I was originally talking to needed to know a little bit about this. Uh, I am a humanities scholar, but I actually also have a, a background in the, in the social sciences. I've, uh, I've done ethno ethnographic work and uh, case uh, study kind of work. I do an awful lot of discourse analysis in, in my work, so I combine actually uh, talking to people or, or gathering data, but also gathering texts that are associated with different organizations. And so I try to get qualitative data and discourse analysis data to talk to each other in uh, most of, of my studies. So I have done research on case presentations as done by medical students, social work students, optometry students. I've done uh, some very interesting work recently looking at what we call border crossing uh, kinds of, of um, discourse. Discourse, the kinds of, of information uh, communication that happens between communities of practitioners. So for example, we did a whole study of letters that go between optometrists and ophthalmologists. And we're doing a study right now, an absolutely fascinating study of the letters that are written by child abuse experts, uh, what we're calling expert witnesses. In fact, we're calling our next piece of work the trial of expert witnesses. Because what we're finding is, are those kinds of documents that have to go from child abuse physicians to lawyers and social workers are extraordinarily complex. They're uh, a mixture of medical language and forensic legal language. And we're finding some very interesting tensions actually emerging across uh, those kinds of, uh, that kind of project. My next project, because I'm a member of a research group and we kind of stagger our project, project to project, is going to be really fascinating and I, I hope the heck we can do it, to echo my, my topic. But we're going to do a project that actually looks at patients as parts of teams. Uh, so we're doing this study in three hospitals uh, across Ontario. And we're looking at, at how information is actually constructed around patients. So we're going to actually do extremely intense studies for about 48 to 50 hours. We haven't got it quite figured out, but we're actually going to track exactly what happens to a patient for a 50-hour period. So we're going to have people there 24 hours a day, actually, in our research group, watching what's happening and also tracking where the information goes from patients because we already know the way information goes is, is absolutely fascinating in terms of healthcare. So that's our next project, which uh, if we get funded, and I'm pretty sure we will, uh, will be the topic probably of my next talk for you. So here's my first insight. Um, and this is a, an insight that actually comes from activity systems theory, and this is the work of Euro Engström. Um, Euro is a, uh, is a European uh, scientist. He's having enormous influence right now in uh, many areas that look into workplace practices. And his most, I guess, insightful, or one of his most insightful in, uh, insights is that technologies work as tools. They come from one community of practice to another, and they bring tacit values and unintended consequences. In other words, technologies are not neutral. They profoundly affect the context in which uh, they are placed. This is, a, um, this is uh, Engstrom's model of an activity system theory, and it's having some very interesting implications across a number of research areas. A lot of people are using this to analyze, in fact, what's happening in, uh, in various kinds of, of workplace contexts. So you can see it's, it's a very kind of a, a, a interactional model. So if you could think, for example, of a patient as being a subject and the instruments uh, might be, for example, EMRs, but they could also be any of the kinds of tools that we use with patients. The object or outcome could be the, the in fact, the care of the, the patient. Division of labor is fascinating, particularly, of course, in, in hospital contexts. The community, which is the larger social community of which a ward, for example, might be a part. And the rules are the, the kinds of, of regulations, uh, the tacit, often tacit, sometimes overt, um, uh, constraints that exist in a situation. And as you can see, you can kind of cross-connect all of these, these different um, 
these different parts of uh, what he would call an activity system. Um, this is proving particularly useful in terms of looking at um, uh, bottlenecks um, in workplace organizations. Actually, Engstrom calls these knots, K-N-O-T's. And he's, he's got this amazing theory right now, what he calls not working theory. And what he's looking at is what people do, especially groups of people do, when they encounter a serious difficulty in their organization. How do they work their way through it? So not working is, in fact, N-O-T, not working. It's actually what are the innovations that people actually construct in order to negotiate their way uh, through bottlenecks within organizations. So he's doing amazing work, particularly in medical areas, uh, regarding this. Uh, one of his most fascinating examples is um, an example of, um, of a, a very ill woman uh, who was locked inside her house. Uh, she had psychiatric illness, and she was actually refusing to open her door. So what Engstrom did was he documented all of the activity that surrounded making that door, opening that door. So he documented all of the documentation that occurred and all of the activities of the different people involved, in fact, in, in opening uh, the door to her, um, to her apartment. It's fascinating. I put this here because one of the, um, one of the um, other things that Engstrom notes a great deal in his research is that the fact that a lot of technologies, particularly EMRs and EPRs, do not support the work of healthcare providers. So, in fact, this uh, this little picture was just to show you, you know, the the, the kind of mess the healthcare providers can find themselves in uh, when, in fact, their technologies do do not support what they do. So, here you have the the spider of, of technology, I guess, uh, attacking this person. Um, in Engstrom's work and in other people's work, actually, he notes the contradictions between clinical and administrative work. Most EMRs and EPRs were actually uh, designed uh, to facilitate administrative work rather than clinical work. And this is particularly, his work is, is in, uh, as I say, in Europe, and he's actually demonstrated in his work what happens when EPRs and e EMRs, which really are focused on administrative work, uh, uh, contradict or, or go against uh, medical concerns. So he looks at issues related to morale, for example, uh, workarounds, the kinds of things that people have to do to negotiate their way around uh, these kinds of problems and the kinds of errors uh, that can occur. Um, this is work that we've also documented in, in my research team. Um, this is the work of Lara Varpio, who's one of my graduate students. And what she did was she went into a ward in uh, Toronto uh, and she sat beside the nurse's station and she watched how people interacted with the computer system. She did this for about three months. So she documented the interaction um, that all of the, the medical staff had with the computer system. Uh, and then went and interviewed people and, and found out, basically said, why did you do this? Why did you do this in this, this kind of circumstances? It was a very in-depth uh, kind of study and she actually won a, a major award. Uh, for her research. What she noticed um, is, is the way that, um, first of all, she did notice that there were a lot of successful interactions with the, the system. But she was, you know, obviously kind of more interested in the negative interactions with the system. And she noticed, for example, that uh, healthcare providers would force the system sometimes. In other words, if the system would not do what it, they wanted it to do, they would beat it into submission. And they would beat it into submission by putting information in places where probably nobody else would find it. So if they wanted to put a note in and they couldn't find a place for it, they would just find anywhere in the system and plug it in to the system. She also noticed a lot of or some people submitting to the system. They would basically say, oh, I can't get this damn thing to do what I want, so I'll, I'll just do whatever I can with it. Uh, and then she actually watched a few people ignoring the system. Of course, they were only the, the high-end doctors could afford to do that, um, uh, simply ignoring the system. Um, she noted in the process that this was actually causing uh, an awful lot of workarounds and errors to occur. Well, uh, certainly a number of workarounds and errors. For example, uh, she watched a young physician uh, trying to put in a, uh, a drug request. And the drug request was a, an unusual one. He wanted a very precise dose uh, for a particular, this was in a children's ward in Toronto, a very precise dose. 
In order to get that precise dose, he had to put it in twice, which also meant that he was ordering more than he needed. Okay, and it was a very powerful drug. Now, what would happen in these kinds of situations is that the people who did this knew they were doing it, and then they would start constructing a fallback plan in order to mitigate any problems that would occur. So this, once he knew he'd done this, okay, he went off and told the nurse. Okay, he created a kind of a, a track, a backtrack for himself, a, a protection, to let the nurse know that he had deliberately made an error in order to get the right kind of drug that he needed. But think about the consequences of not doing that. Uh, for example, forgetting to talk to the nurse about what you had done, all those kinds of things. We also noticed the way that um, people actually used the, um, the computer system, and that was fascinating, because they actually used it as a printer. Okay? They would print off huge amounts of this material. Okay? They would print it off, and then they would reconfigure it to support their work days, because the, the print-offs or the, the material in the system did not accommodate the way they worked. So the nurses, for example, would print off this material. They would then restructure it to fit their work days. The docs would do exactly the same thing, but they would do a different kind of chart. There was a tradition in this ward, in fact, of the doctors and nurses reconfiguring this material differently to, in fact, uh, support uh, their work. We also discovered that uh, there were a number of versions of records across the hospital, uh, that it was almost like a, a half paper, kind of half electronic uh, kind of ward uh, situation. And so there were different versions, actually, of the... Um, get this to go again. Yeah. Um, there were different versions of, of records across the hospital. Obviously, in some ways, the electronic record was the main record, but it in fact was not the record that was being used on a daily basis. Other kinds of records existed on the ward um, that, uh, uh, that were being used in different kinds of ways. So very interesting what people do when the system does not exactly support what they're doing. My second insight, and this is, comes very much uh, from the work of, of Bruno Latour, and he kind of escalates Angstrom. Angstrom said that tools affect their environments, whereas what Bruno Latour suggests is that technologies function as agents. They actually change the nature of work in different kinds of contexts. And his, his, his work is fascinating. It's occurring across a lot of different fields right now. It's called actor network theory. It's very much present in science and technology studies. Uh, a whole fascinating series of, of, of research areas are emerging as a result of his work. And it's really interesting when you think about a technology as being an agent, as profoundly changing the nature of the work that's occurring in different kinds of contexts. Uh, I don't know how I got there. I'm going backwards, that's why. Another really interesting uh, area, or an area in which uh, this is playing out um, in terms of, uh, of Angstrom's uh, work, is uh, in the area of, uh, of classification, um, in terms of, uh, for example, um, the classification of, of diseases and so forth. One of the most important contributions of information systems is that, is that they enhance the ability to classify aspects of disease and illness this means you can slice and dice information and compare and contrast across huge data sets, right? Great stuff. But there is a dark side to this, this ability to actually classify and, and slice and dice information. Um, and that is frequently the medical story, uh, the soap story, the nursing narrative, the social work account uh, cannot be accommodated. And this, was, this loss was really demonstrated to me um, by an article that I just reviewed and then I'm sure will uh, get published because it was an absolutely amazing article. In that article, the researchers reported on an information system used in a psychiatric outpatient clinic. And what the social, they were kind of like social worker um, psychiatrists. You know, some social workers actually take on psychiatric uh, kinds of, of techniques and strategies. So what the social workers had to do was uh, they had to go out and into home settings and so forth, and they had to assess what was going on in those home settings. When they came back into their offices, they then had to import, input the information uh, that they received into this online form. And this online form was a series of categories, actually, uh, that they, they had to uh, fill in. Um, 
And the impact of that, that form was having a tremendous impact on their ability to practice. The reason it was is that uh, they actually had to make very small units of information fit into these forms. And there was a profound loss of the, the medical and, and patient narrative actually occurring. And what was actually happening in this organization were a number of very important errors were occurring in terms of care. They had an external agency come in, a government agency come in, and that was actually the diagnosis that the government agency had of what was going on, and that it was in that it was their online system that was actually causing a number of the kinds of errors uh, that were occurring within this organization. And it was because of this loss of, of coherence and cohesion uh, that was happening across these, these kinds of documentations. Uh, lots of, a loss of information and lots of workarounds, too, to, to accommodate the fact that they weren't being able to highlight, for example, the most important features of this case. They weren't able to argue for certain kinds of care uh, in these kinds of situations. The fact that they were breaking up the information to these small units was having a, a profound effect on this organization, and they were having to rework uh, their entire record-keeping system as a result of, of this. And I don't know, this is where I kind of get into the, the dark side of the field again. Um, one of the things I've been quite fascinated by, because I'm a language person as, as well as a, you know, a social science person, is I'm, I'm really fascinated by this, this one of the consequences I see, and it's not just a consequence of EMRs and EPR, I actually think it's, it's a long-term trajectory uh, within medicine. And that is the, the whole way that we're turning people into cases, okay? We're turning people, this, this whole concept of turning people into cases is, is just fascinating to me. What I've done here is I've actually tracked for you the word case, as it occurs in the Oxford English Dictionary. Because originally case meant uh, a thing that happens to you, a chance. Uh, it actually, of course, was associated uh, a lot with legal, um, the facts of the case, for example. An incident required an investigation uh, by police. It wasn't until 1830 that it actually became associated, in fact, with the condition of a disease in a person or with people. But now look how it's used. It's actually been turned into um, an adjective in this case. Case management, the coordinated course of action determined for a particular person's medical care, social support, that's 1918, and a case manager, a person such as a doctor, nurse, or social worker who is assigned to coordinate and monitor the care or support of a particular individual. Uh, as you can see then, uh, by the year 1969, people have become cases. And you, should, you say, well, why should we worry about that? I think we need to worry about it. For one thing, I think one of the consequences is, is that we're not working towards patient-centered care if we start thinking about people in this way. And I always find it absolutely amazing when I look at the criteria for evidence-based medicine, right? You've all seen the criteria for evidence-based medicine. And you know that patient-centered care is one of, it's the very last one in the line, right? But to me, there's a huge contradiction right now between the first three categories in uh, as the descriptors of evidence-based medicine and that last uh, descriptor of uh, patient-centered care. Because I think there's, there's, a, real, there's a, a real effort to do. Uh, we want people to encourage, we want to encourage people to assume more control of their lives and their care, uh, but I think there's trajectories within medicine um, that actually prevent that and that are associated with technologies is too. Now I move to the lighter side of things. One of the most interesting, I think, areas of research, in particularly in workplace communication, um, is the whole insight uh, regarding education and the role of education in workplaces. And this is very much the work of Leib and Wenger. And if you haven't looked at the work of Leib and Wenger, I definitely suggest that you do, because you've all heard the concept of communities of practice, Right, a lot of people. That's a, a, a you know, it's a key word right now. Uh, that, that actually comes from um, Laban Wenger's work. They look at workplaces as inherently learning communities. Uh, they think that most groups of people, when they get together, by the way, that's a central activity that's happening. Is that we are constantly teaching and learning all the time. It's a feature, in fact, of of, of being human. Is this teaching and learning that's going on? and it's a particular feature of workplaces. They also suggest that more is learned through what they call legitimate peripheral participation 
than through overt instruction. And in fact, I am seeing more and more research uh, that actually suggests that informal forms of learning are one of the most powerful uh, forms of learning uh, in, in most uh, situations. Um, the difficult uh, aspect, though, of legitimate peripheral participation is that it is tacit. An awful lot is actually taught through tacit work. To explain uh, the concept of legitimate peripheral participation, it basically means that most of us, when we're learning relatively complex kinds of activities, we kind of sit on the edge of, of that activity. We watch people doing it, we watch the experts, and we gradually acquire more and more expertise over time through having our, our activities affirmed, in fact, by the people who know. And if you really think about, for example, the way uh, that young doctors are treated on the wards, you really, this is a, that's an amazing example, actually, of legitimate peripheral participation in action. The problem is, though, is that it is tacit. And things can be taught tacitly that you really have to challenge sometimes. At least a lot of my work has been that. I actually look a lot at what they call the uh, hidden curriculum in medicine and in uh, all healthcare disciplines. I think there's some interesting implications of this kind of research, particularly when you think about uh, the whole issue of informal learning, for example, and group learning. And one of them is, is that usability research has limited value. When you have, uh, if, if you're doing usability research and you're only looking at how one or two people interact with a system, maybe you'll do a whole progression of this or watching how they're in, in, uh, interacting with a system in a lab, it's of limited value. Because these systems are brought into huge social contexts where there's multiple users and, and, and they're also brought into situations often when, of chaos, where, where people are, are desperate to get their work done. And if you haven't done pilot projects, controlled pilot projects where you watch what happens when you bring a technology into a workplace, I think you're, you're going to lead to workarounds, you're going to lead to errors, you're going to lead to very disgruntled people actually uh, trying to work with the, the technologies. So what I'm constantly suggesting to people is that they observe the introduction of new technologies carefully. Watch the workarounds. They're signals of problems, but they're also signals of innovations. Frequently, those workarounds are not negative. They, those people in that context have actually figured out a really good way to work with that system. And sometimes you can adjust the system to really uh, uh, to, to the workaround. So you need to watch what people are doing when you actually introduce a system to them. When you introduce technologies into a workplace, always ask yourself what is being tacitly taught, meaning technologies come with ideological strings attached. They come with expectations. Think about that study that I talked to you about uh, where they, they tracked what happened in that, that psychiatric unit. The people who designed that system believed that it was worthwhile to break up information into these little bits, probably so they could slice and dice it and use it in other contexts. But that was a value that did not fit that workplace. As I say, this was originally for another, another group. So I'm suggesting that people create adjustable, flexible systems that adjust to different kinds of contexts. My last insight is that technological innovations succeed because of hype and technological innovations fail because of hype. This is, believe it or not, technolo technological innovations succeed because of hype has been proved by Bruno Latour. He's done absolutely fascinating work tracking why certain kinds of technologies succeed and why they don't. And one of the main reasons that a technological innovation succeeds is that it gets allies. It gets groups of people for whom it satisfies some kinds of need of some type, and then they develop more allies, and so in fact you get a whole group of people together who support a certain kind of innovation. At the same time, technological innovations fail because of hype, because of that sense of false promise. I've seen an awful lot of, of you know, aggressive kinds of advertising that, that comes with particularly EMRs and EPRs, and overpromise, and you've got a problem, it seems to me. So my implications for this kind of, of you know, project is don't overpromise. Bring your users right into the design process and listen, really listen to their concerns 
and build those workarounds into the systems so that you can adjust, in fact, to their contexts. So that's my talk that I gave to a group of practitioners, and I'm open to questions. Plenty of time for questions and comments and discussion and all that. Uh, we first heard this talk, we thought it was a very interesting one and uh, uh, got a lot of uh, different uh, feedback from people on it. Just wanted to mention, Kathy, that I believe uh, the talks by Wenger, Wallace, and Sorensen are now up on the web, the, our web. Uh, yes, that's So we do. You actually can uh, see a presentation by Tim Wenger. Uh, Deb Wallace and um, Ivan Sorensen uh, on the web about communities of practice, so the research that they've done. So it's on our website. Um, and there, we're having another workshop on that eventually on, uh, with the uh, Ministry of Research and Innovation. I agree with you um, that about that. One of the things that, um, that, by the way, that came out of that meeting is a rather trivial thought, but it was it sort of really was important, is that uh, you can't have a community of practice until you create a community. Uh, the point out that a lot of the work that's done, particularly in technological innovation, creates the landing spot but doesn't create the community. And rather, the first act must be to create the community with common interests and so on. I wonder how that factors into some of the things you are interested in. Um, from my perspective, communities already exist. They usually pre-exist the technologies. I mean, there's always technologies there uh, because even things like pens and pencils are, are technologies. Uh, so communities pre-exist, it seems to me, um, the technologies that come into them. But the technologies will profoundly, or sometimes can profoundly change the nature of work within that group. When you saw Inkstrom's little diagram, think of what happens. You know, you pull a string. When you bring in a new instrument, for example, what's it going to do, in fact, to the outcomes? What's it going to do to the people? What's it going to do to the rules that exist within that workplace setting? It will change them. The thing is, as a, as a change manager, is first of all, you really have to observe those changes. You have to watch what's happening to make sure that you haven't changed your outcome. For example, if your outcome is patient care and you bring in a, a technology that is heavily invested in administration, you could be causing a problem in terms of, of those outcomes. It's kind of why I like Angstrom's work so well, is he gives you a tool to start you know, teasing some of these things apart and start figuring out what's happening. Yeah, one of the really good examples of that, um, Larry Weed, sort of those of us who are older know him probably better than the younger people, developed a concept called uh, problem-oriented medical record, POMR. It was back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, and promoted it quite highly. He also developed an information system, which was quite innovative in its day. In fact, it was in the American Federation of Information Processing Society proceedings in about 1969. Uh, really, it's 1970. A really interesting thing. He introduced it in Vermont uh, into um, uh, the hospital there that he worked in. And uh, it was absolutely loved by the nurses because it gave them the ability to make clinical diagnoses that were uh, significantly better than uh, there. But it was hated by the physicians. It was interesting. Uh, the reflection is that it changed the role of the nurses, and the physicians really didn't care for that. We was run out of there on a rail, uh, just sort of being tarred and feathered. Uh, and has always had that problem that he's, his invention, so to speak, empowers a different group of people than he thought it would empower. Well, actually, I began, this is really funny, when you mentioned weed. My first study was a study of veterinary medicine. I was uh -huh. hired as an ethnographer to do a study of literacy in the Ontario Veterinary College, okay, many years ago. And I was absolutely amazed at the impact of weed, Lawrence Weed. They, they had decided to adopt the POMR, a, a veterinary version of the POMR, and force it across their clinics and into their classrooms. Okay? And it was fascinating watching the impact on, on their teaching and learning and on what was happening in their clinics. Um, because what I also discovered when I went out into the discipline, when I went out and talked to veterinarians, is they would never use weed in practice. Hmm. It was way too labor intensive in fact, for them to use in practice. So you had this really interesting, and, and all, mind you, the insurance companies, again, I talked to some insurance companies, they really wanted them to use POMR because, in fact, it was a much, it, it very much better documented, in fact, uh, cases. But veterinarians could not run enough cases through their clinics 
to actually support the POMR system. So it was just fascinating. They'd actually integrated, into, for example, into their exam system. They actually had exams in the clinical area where you had to actually you know, identify the, the problem. I, they didn't call it the POMR. They, they, had a, a, they had a different name for it, but it was Weed's system. And it, it was causing chaos. If you haven't looked at that, it's really worth looking at because what he did was to say patients have problems. It may not be diagnoses. There may be pain as opposed to a symptom. And you link everything that you do to those problems. And he had a thing, your soap of today, which is a, related to the technology, his soap of yesterday was, it was a subjective, objective analysis assessment. And and, plans. Yeah, analysis yeah, and plans. Analysis yeah. and plans. And, and um, you know, it was a very interesting structure, but you're right, it took a lot of effort. Yeah. The yeah. problem with the, the POMR was that whole sense of problems, because what you did was you ran through the soap, right? And then you identified a series of problems that you thought were characteristic or, or were, were that patients. But they were not supposed to be diagnoses. They were supposed to be like clusters of signs and symptoms that you would kind of go through. And what you were supposed to do is it was a very cyclical kind of system. So you solved the first problem, then you solve the second problem, and then you solve the third problem. So it was very cyclical. Yeah, or uh, refine the problem was another yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you'd have to go through this. And so you can imagine the depth of records that would occur yeah. Okay, yeah. On, on animals. But they're extremely competent records. I mean, they actually oh, meant something were. And, and were very, very good. Uh, I always wondered in the, in the case of the veterinary college, was the subjective one bark, bark, bark? No, or something no, or? They, they actually had a, they had a, Questions. they had a different word for it. Data, they called it data analysis and plans. Uh, okay. Because, of course, in veterinary medicine, it's subjective, as you know, is, is when you talk to the patient, yeah. you can't talk to animals. Therefore, they put subjective and objective into one category, which they called data. It's cute. Questions? Catherine, you've looked at technology and people interacting with technology. Have you ever had the opportunity to suggest how the technology might be changed and seen the change and then observed what happened? Um, my graduate student is working on that right now because what she did when she, and this is, you know, sort of, sort of like secondhand uh, kind of thing, uh, when she, uh, one of the things she did she looked at very carefully was the visual interface of that um, of that uh, that system, and so she made uh, and she worked very closely with the um, their IAP you know, their their technology people um, to suggest changes to the interface because a lot of the problems they were experiencing were actually visual interface kinds of problems. I have been a change agent in organizations. Uh, I've been a change agent in an insurance company, for example, and in the Ontario Veterinary College, not as with regards to technology so much, but as, as to regards to practices. Uh, so uh, to do that, though, is, is a very uh, labor-intensive, uh, you have to go in and do workshops uh, with people. You often have to produce uh, model projects, uh, uh, products, or at least designs that they can then implement. And when you do that, you can never actually predict what they're going to do with it either, because People will take things and use them in different kinds of ways. So I worked very intensively once with an insurance company to uh, get them to rework their, oh my God, they were terrible, um, to rework the way they actually interacted with their clients. Um, you know those decline letters when you, you can't get an insurance claim filled? Okay. Uh, but with that, I actually had to work with the writers themselves. I actually had to produce templates for them so they could bring it over and then teach them the principles of the template so they could bring the principles over into their own practices, which were even more important than the template. So I've supervised change, right, And I've, in technology, but I've not done it. But I know how to do it if I had to. <laughs> Thank you. I agree with you that users must be involved in the design process, otherwise it's not going to be of much of a system that either at least the user will use or it won't be much to improve the efficiency of the whole process. Um, but I, my problem is, okay, we are supposedly uh, bringing technology to improve the efficiency of the system, and by improving the system, we hopefully make patient treated better. Okay, that's I hope is the reason why we're doing it, not just because we like to sell computers to all, you know, hospitals and others. So, Mike, uh, you know, how would you uh, discuss this problem? Like, okay, we are trying to actually improve patient 
care, but not, uh, you know, in, in the sense that you feel that it is being done. Uh, so I, I don't know whether there's, you know, can we say now we shouldn't have technology? I, I suppose that's not what you, you mean. Uh, so there is, you know, I, I'm not sure uh, your message, you know, what it is. I mean, you're not going to say, tell us we can't use any more EMRs and whatever the technology that we're bringing in. No, that's not my message at all. For one thing, that's impossible. I mean, you know, that's like a floodgate. I mean, that's like, I can't even say it. Uh, technolo technology will always be here. Paper records are a technology. They are a technology. My problem is, first of all, or when we're implementing this, I guess two things. First of all, whatever we do has to support the work of the people in the clinics. If it doesn't support their clinical work, if it is a administ mostly administrative system, and you're going to get a lot of workarounds. You're going to get a lot of problems associated with it. Secondly, <clears throat> you have to look very carefully at the unintended, uh, I don't even know if they're unintended, but the values that are built into a system. Systems come with strings attached to them. They come often with the values of their community. So, for example, if you are a straight uh, technology person who wants a really clean and slick system, that's a value that you have. But you haven't thought about the mess and chaos on the wards and the kinds of ways that people interact with it. You've brought your clean, neat system into a situation where it doesn't fit. The fact that there's recursive work happening, that there's multiple users of this system. And you haven't thought about uh, the way that people actually use the system. For example, we were astonished by the number, the amount of oral communication that happens on the wards that actually supports and changes what goes into that, that EMR and EPR. So I guess two messages I'm sending. Make sure it supports the, the clinical work that's happening and then watch the kinds of values that are built into the system, a straight administrative system reflecting the, the values of, of, for example, cost containment and so forth will probably not be a sufficiently developed system um, to last for a long time. And also building flexibility, building ways that the users can actually change or can put change in relatively quickly. I know somebody always has to manage the change with, that happens, right? But you have to build a way to change the system in right at the very beginning to accommodate changes across time within organizations. We can't ignore technology. It's just it, it will be there. I just want to point out that uh, I just came back from Chicago American Medical Informatics meeting, and the presentations are dominated by psychosocial aspects of systems. Uh, technology, you'll see technology on how to write clinical protocols using some sort of formal language. Uh, you'll see some stuff on user interface that's technically sophisticated, but I'd say about 75% of the material is related to the recognition that the psychosocial dimensions uh, that we have kind of ignored in introducing these systems have caused a large number of failures. And mm -hmm. we exist in a, yeah. an environment that uh, there's virtually no evidence that these systems do make a difference in patient outcomes. There is some evidence they do improve efficiency, but very little evidence of outcomes. And then some recent work, and if you haven't looked at this, Coppell's work, K-O-P-P-E-L, I think it is, uh, 1L, uh, is uh, uh, showed that, uh, that these systems introduced uh, t in order to reduce adverse events actually cause 25 new kinds of errors, literally mm -hmm. 25 new kinds of errors. Uh, Hans' work at Pittsburgh uh, demonstrated, they, they feel they demonstrated, the people have questioned the, the actual study itself, but an association of mortality in the children's institution with the introduction of a system. Again, the word's association, it doesn't mean it's cause. So we have, we have a, a more and more evidence that, that these systems either don't produce what we want or produce adverse events themselves, or otherwise impact the institution, that we've got to go back to looking at not just the technology, but what we call the complementary factors around the technology that include uh, cultural uh, understanding of, of what they're being introduced into, uh, the um, management of change, uh, re-engineering of work processes, uh, restructuring of human resources, and, and of course the buy-in of everybody. So, uh, Kathy, you've become much more relevant as time <laughs> oh, goes gee, on. Uh, I feel it's uh, it's the most viable area of research. I don't know, any of you, uh, or else, do you have a comment on any aspect One of that? One thing I would say too: think about the word system. What is the system? I don't think the EMRs are the system. 
No. The system is the hospital. The system is the ward. And, and I think that's a major mistake we're making. We're not thinking about how technologies fit into the real system. The real system is the hospital, the ward, uh, with the patient, of course, being you know the, ob or the subject, in fact, of the system. So to think of them as being the system, I think is, is wrong-headed. It's just wrong-headed. They are part of much more complicated systems, where people are doing the most amazing things to work around and figure out these systems and deal with them. And we haven't been watching what people are doing, actually. Not enough, at least. Any other comments? Yeah. Catherine, what about uh, telehealth systems and, and health care that's delivered, uh, say, right into people's homes? How, do, how does that fit into all this? Um, in terms of, well, that's a really interesting one because telehealth, of course, I mean, I could accommodate it, for example, within Angstrom's uh, kind of work. It's profoundly changing um, the way that healthcare is delivered. It's, uh, of course, it's not exactly a recording system. It's not like an EPR or an EMR. In fact, what's really interesting about telehealth is it's like a, a, it's, a it's a network of technologies that is, are, is being used in order to transport, I guess, health or healthcare into different kinds of venues. It's very much like, like distance education in a way. It's, it's got, it's, to me, it's got the same kind of feel to it as distance education. Uh, and yes, it, it's profoundly changing. Yeah, Technology has profoundly changed their context, and it is profoundly changing the way health is being delivered in certain kinds of areas. Do you, th do you, think, do you think telehealth is, 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 is a, 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 something that will help us achieve the kind of patient-centered care you were talking about? I mean, it brings the, the healthcare community right into, it, to someone's, into someone's home. It can. It all depends on how it's being used. I'm sure, like any other system, it could also be used extremely badly as well. I mean, you could have, for example, uh, uh, if you, I mean, I, I could imagine it being used extremely ineffectively as well as extremely effectively. It seems to me that there's a power there for it to be used effectively in terms of patient-centered care. But think about, a, I can imagine a system where a, a patient is centered or is in their home, for example, and is being you know, directed and abused by a doctor elsewhere. The technology could lend itself either way. It seems to me it's not just an, uh, you know, it's not automatically good. Just like records aren't automatically good or automatically bad, it all depends on how they're designed and how they're being used and what kinds of values are present within the system. Do you think it's one of those uh, in inexorable floodgates that we will just have to deal with? Now, is that... Which one, technology or all of it, telehealth? Uh, it's, I'm going to have to say it's like distance education. It's going to depend. Uh, in many situations, face-to-face -face medicine still works best. But in some situations, face-to-face -face medicine is not possible. And therefore, uh, telehealth is, is, a, is a viable um, option, it seems to me, in those kinds of situations. It would also be a situation, too, I think, where expertise maybe can be better distributed in terms of, of telehealth. But it all depends on how it's being used in what kinds of circumstances, what kinds of values are present. To give you, to actually, to give you an example, um, as opposed to the face-to-face -face type of healthcare, uh, the development of patient portals is a big, hot thing. Everybody's building one. Uh, so like everybody building their own uh, building, uh, if you can imagine the architectural impact of that. The, um, we just are involved with a, a, a program funded by Canada Health InfoWay that looks at chronic kidney disease management. And basically what it's trying to do is keep people longer as chronic kidney disease patients before they go into dialysis. That's really what it's about. Um, if you look at it, though, in terms of the issues, the technologies that are available are things like email between patients and doctors, but doctors don't like to communicate with patients by email problem. Uh, patients can communicate with each other, but communicate what and how effective is that? Uh, it turns out in, in CKD that a high percentage of patients, 40% or plus, are depressed. 
and depressed people don't like to use technology. So we're delivering a technology that they're not likely to use. And none of the systems, this, except one we've got, you know, actually had an impact on, are, are assessing the depression of the patient, even though simple scales exist. So they're intervening with uh, tools that are of questionable effectiveness on people who probably won't even use the tool and claiming to keep people in a state which is very difficult to assess when they went into it and when they went off it. I mean, you're going to look at a lot of technology developed without visible effect. So that, that whole area of, of delivery of technology directly to the patient is a challenging one. And there's, again, there's no evidence in the literature, right? Cl countless clinical trials. When you put it all together, it says overall the effect is neutral. It, you know, it doesn't kill people. It doesn't make them better either. So it, that's a problem. And the fact that so many people in the health system are doing this as total gross amateurs, technological amateurs. We've seen the failure to use current technologies, uh, te current structures of programming. I mean, things like iterative programming and, and th that kind of model. We're seeing a failure to understand the medical problems. And we're creating systems where it is possible that people will get a different kind of care from the access to the portal at home than they get when they go into the clinic because nobody's dealt yet with the adoption of the clinic with exactly the same guidelines and, and uh, criteria and so on that are used for the portal. So, I mean, it's a huge change. And, I mean, we, we need more people to look at it. We've been fortunate, and we've got a woman from McMaster who's got some expertise in this area, but uh, we really need teams of people to look at these types of systems and do them in a way that makes sense. I don't know if you have any comment on that, but it seems like a massive problem area. The question is, what's the system? Mm -hmm. yeah. Any final comments? I have a very quick question, Kathy. I was fascinated uh, with your idea of the loss of narrative at the point where uh, information gets entered into the EMR and uh, EPR systems. Uh, you also mentioned that such systems uh, get reworked in order to uh, represent this uh, narrative component, which is essential to healthcare. Um, uh, in this uh, um, uh, patient record. Uh, so uh, I was wondering how exactly do they represent this uh, 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 temporal uh, elements and, uh, and other uh, uh, features of uh, medical and uh, health knowledge that are associated with narratives? That is, how exactly uh, narratives look in uh, EPR and uh, e EMR systems? Um, okay, social work narratives, unfortunately, are usually relegated to a, a section of the EMR or EPR. They are kept as a narrative. They're often kept as a straight narrative, uh, but it's like nobody goes there uh, to check them except for the social workers, which is a problem. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, if they're, the narrative structure of the EMR should replicate, if at all possible, the narrative structure of medicine which right now, of course, is, is data analysis and plan, uh, uh, SOAP, whatever that is. Now, that itself is a bit of a problem, okay, I'll tell you that right now, from the perspective of my kind of research, because it's actually kind of a problem in the way that medical narratives themselves are formulated. There, there's some really I interesting ideological problems in the terms of the way medical narratives are currently formulated. At the same time, because it is so ingrained within medical problem-solving techniques, if you're going to have a, an EPR or an EMR system that works, you should replicate that, you should at least replicate that system so that people can support their clinical work. But from my perspective, there is in fact a problem with the way the current <coughs> medical story works. But that medical story, quite frankly, is so ingrained right now uh, it's been present in, I can trace it right back to the 1890s and the 1880s as the medical way of solving problems. And I actually, at this point, I don't think the profession itself can come up with a, a different way of accommodating it. There have been attempts. Um, there's a medical doctor in the United States, um, O'Donnell, I think, who's done fascinating works trying to rework um, the medical story to bring in more patient information right at the top bring in patient language, because right now the medical story eliminates patient language. I've, we've documented this over and over again in our own research. Uh, a direct quotation rarely ever appears 
within the medical narrative, and when it does, it's always uh, the patient reported, and it's put in quotes. It's just like, we don't really believe it uh, kind of thing. Whereas other healthcare professions, for example, actually do directly quote uh, patients. They actually put in, uh, social workers do, uh, some nursing accounts do as well. Uh, but there is this, this very strongly held belief within medicine that you do not report. Or if you do, it's, it's always, uh, they said, you know, we really don't believe them, uh, kind of use of language. So it's an interesting theoretical problem, actually, for me. The other thing that may help this is the personal health record, which is gradually beginning to move on where patients are expected to contribute to it directly. It might be, might be a resource. Um, the only thing I can think of with the story is to create some sort of framework that allows you to link uh, statements within the uh, digitized, I'll call it, record together in a form that uh, shows their relationship temporally and otherwise might make a difference. Uh, any uh, further comments or? Kathy, I wanted to thank you very much. I uh, really enjoyed this. Uh, each time I hear it, I learn more. <laughs> so look forward to the, to the next time. Thank you very thank much. You.